Hello, welcome to the Bird Watching Channel. I'm your host, Sharon Sorensen, here to talk about, well, birders gone buggy. As a backyard bird watcher and gardener myself, I'm excited about my own membership in the BGB. In fact, according to a recent magazine poll, it's the fastest growing group of birders in the U.S. Maybe you're members too, without my knowing. We don't have the accoutrements of a formal club, so we don't have meetings or officers. But we're here. We're birders gone buggy, focusing our binoculars on birds, then redialing the focus to butterflies, skippers, dragonflies, or other beauty bugs. As my garden cycles through its seasonal stages, well, of course, birds keep it all aflutter. In early summer, for instance, ruby-throated hummingbirds are drawn to nectar-rich blossoms across the garden, including prairie dock. Then they move on to royal catchfly, followed by the wonderfully aromatic sweet bay magnolia blossoms. Late summer draws hummers to the shoulder-high blossoms of joe pie weed and stately spears of hyssop blooms. By fall, just before they migrate back to Costa Rica, hummingbirds find sustenance at the wide-ranging patches of jewelweed, and they never fail to nectar long and deep at the pink turtlehead. By contrast, American goldfinches forage in the garden year-round. As the tall Coreopsis goes to seed, well, actually, even before the seed heads turn brown, the goldfinches are plucking nutrition from the seeds and even yanking off the petals. Equally, they relish seed heads of purple coneflower, Tennessee coneflower, and black-eyed Susans. And oh my, when the eight-foot-tall prairie coneflowers, those magnificent Rebecca maximas, form their massive conical seed heads, well, American goldfinches just spend days feeding on them. Then in early winter, long after blossoms and greenery have disappeared, those same American goldfinches, now in drab, basic plumage, go for the buttonbush seed heads, the birds blending into their surroundings so well that if they weren't bouncing around among the branches, I'd never even see them. But all those garden blossoms and seeds and berries, you know what? They attract more than just birds. They also attract bugs. All kinds of little flying and crawling critters that forage among the same garden blossoms as the hummingbirds and the goldfinches and all the others. And that's good. In fact, we're told to feed the birds, we must first feed the bugs. Hmm. Sounds a little strange. Why feed the bugs? Why not just get rid of them? Well, here's why. All songbirds, except goldfinches and doves, feed their babies bugs. Now, I'm using the term bugs here as an all-inclusive term to refer to insects and their eggs and their larval farms like caterpillars and true bugs, all of the above. So 96% of all songbirds feed their babies bugs. No bugs, no babies. And native plants support native bugs that feed our native birds. Awesome. It's a mother nature's master plan. Native plants support native bugs that feed the native birds. And as a reward for nurturing bugs with my native garden, I'm treated to early evening displays with as many as 30 to 35 bugs zigzagging through the sky, purple martins shown here with dragonflies and cicadas, and barn swallows that build mud nests, and tree swallows that nest in cavities, all these swallows and martins diving, dipping, snagging bugs on the wing. The most curious part of this multiple species evening act is the apparent set of invisible borders inside which they hunt. Strictly, straight up, 
above my native garden. But during the day, especially during the brightest, hottest, and most blistering hours, that native garden that's planted primarily for the birds, by default also hosts the most spectacular of all bugs, butterflies. Big yellow and black tiger swallowtails that flock to buttonbush blossoms and American wisteria and joe pie weed and prairie dock while the sometimes black-colored female tiger swallowtails are found here on liatris and purple coneflower. And what a joy to host the seriously declining monarchs in the native garden as they enjoy asters, button liatris, joe pie weed, and of course their common host plant, common milkweed. Spice bush swallowtails, attracted by our spice bushes, nectar all summer across the garden, and sometimes I have to look really closely to separate black swallowtails from spice bush swallowtails and female tiger swallowtails. Buckeyes bring me joy late into fall, nectaring then on Virginia mountain mint. Painted ladies, less numerous than some other butterflies in my garden, typically prefer asters and head-high prairie dock. And silver-spotted skippers, ah, they're there all summer and into fall. And they're nectaring on things like blue salvia, blue lobelia, black-eyed Susan, and in the fall, the New England aster. Eastern-tailed blue and the very similar and equally tiny summer azure all enjoy the mountain mints both Virginia and short tooth. And there's nothing like the cheerful orange sulfurs for adding bright color to the garden, especially as they nectar on Letterman's ironweed. The camouflage question mark butterfly, you know, it's named for that distinct little white question mark on its wing. It always catches me off guard. It's so well hidden, even in plain view, nectaring on Missouri coneflowers. Ah, and I mustn't forget to add the little pearl crescents to the list, ranging as they do across the entire garden. Ah, but my favorite may well be the zebra swallowtail, nectaring here, appropriately, on butterfly weed. To date, well, I photographed 56 butterfly species in the native garden. Truth be known, I had no idea we had 56 kinds of butterflies here in southwestern Indiana. In fact, however, according to field guides, we have more than 100. And of course, not all will visit gardens, as some are more forest creatures or depend on other non-garden-like habitats. Still, these most beautiful of bugs give life to a garden far beyond birds, a garden during all seasons, even in winter, when birds tuck in under overarching plants for the protection against the elements. Yet in summer, blue-gray gnatcatchers forage for bugs among the flowers, bluebirds snag caterpillars or drop plunge for bugs for their fledglings, migrating black-throated green warblers pluck caterpillars from native bald cypress trees, and migrating black pole warblers fatten up on the berries of gray dogwood before flying on to South America for the winter. In autumn, northern cardinals forage native winterberry bushes for plumage enriching berries, and they continue forage through the frost-killed seed-laden garden for winter sustenance. White-crowned sparrows, newly arrived migrants, likewise forage on seed heads, preparing to stay a few winter months, making themselves at home in the rich garden. Indigo buntings, though, have feasted on seeds here all summer. And undisturbed by the new arrivals, Carolina wrens poke about for bug eggs and larvae, knowing just where to search in the garden, intimately familiar with every inch of their year-round home. Eastern towies, like this female, scratch out bugs from the pine straw mulch, foraging for their usual wintertime fare. And so it goes for birders gone buggy. We thrill to the birds that survive on the bugs that our native plants support. 
and so indeed for BGB clubbers, birds are only part of the garden's flight. Bugs merit binocular focus too. Bugs that also feed the birds. Well, hope you've enjoyed this little short quip about birders gone buggy, and I hope you'll join the club making sure that your native plants support your native bugs that feed your native birds. Meanwhile, if you'd like to learn more about bird watching, I hope you'll take a look at one of my books, Birds in the Yard Month by Month, How Birds Behave, or especially in light of today's program, Planting Native to Attract Birds to Your Yard. Or visit my website, or join me on Facebook, where I try to post something almost every day about birds and bird habitat. Meanwhile, I hope you enjoy the birds and the bugs, and may you always have birds in your binoculars. <laughs>